Hey YouTube, and welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry as I continue my search for historical knowledge here on YouTube. All right, today's video comes to you from our patron pledgers. And this week they voted on this video, which was American Wars We All Kinda Just Forgot. Um, this is by Alternate History Hub. So interesting for them because they do what if kind of scenarios. And I don't know if that's going to happen in this but it's kind of an interesting thing and i guess it continues on with kind of the american history kick we've been on with the last couple videos so seems kind of fitting there um to continue with that all right so we're gonna get started in just a sec if you like this original video make sure you go down below alternate history hub is awesome um especially if you're into what if scenarios in history they're one of the kind of the top in the game at that on youtube so there'll be a link down below that you can go to head over there give them a like give them a view um, give them a subscription if you have not, and that would be awesome. If you haven't subbed to my channel, I'd love to have you around too and be a part of our community. Hit that sub button, enable notifications so you know when live streams and live premieres are, and uh, hope to see you around a lot. Okay, all right, let's go ahead and get started with the American Wars everyone kind of forgot about. Any predictions of what those might be? I don't know if they're going to be super obscure or not. I don't really want to make any predictions right now, but I mean... I think people don't talk about the War of 1812 very much. Um, also, I guess what it's going to depend on what they define as a war, right? Just like a skirmish or the U.S. getting involved indirectly into something like that. Um, people don't talk as much about, like, the Mexican-American War. I mean, these are, if you're an actual history student, yeah, but, like, it just gets overshadowed, right? So I don't know how deep they're going to go. Those are major wars, but maybe don't get talked about as some. But anyway, that's just kind of what I was thinking. America. It's Memorial Day, which isn't simply just an excuse to have a longer weekend, it's officially the federal holiday to pay respects to those who died in all the wars the United States has fought in. You know, World War II, Vietnam, the Civil War, the Quasi War, the Cherokee Wars, the Boxer Rebellion, uh... Ah, Boxer Rebellion, America got involved, that's the... the... Um, war in China where they were trying to, this group, the, the Boxers, Righteous and Harmonious Fists is what their name were, trying to get rid of foreign influence. And the Americans amongst a whole bunch of ho coalition of foreign nations are like, nah, we're not leaving China. Sorry, you guys are too uh, important for us economically. And yeah, you're going to do what we say and accept our un uh, unfair treaties and all that stuff. So, okay. Huh. When Americans think about the wars their own country has fought in, they often think of just the big ones. Sure. World War I, Korean War, Iraq War. But ever since the U.S. was just 13 little states, it's been involved in numerous brief wars, both local and abroad, and a surprising number of them have kinda just been forgotten about. Okay. So I want to talk about some of the wars we aren't taught about in history class. Is this alternate history? No. No, it is not. Um, I don't teach U.S. history. Uh, I did early in my career. So it'll be interesting to see if they pull up stuff that wasn't part of the curriculum um, at all, or if it was. I don't know. The real video I planned about Canada didn't seem too smart to release on Memorial Day weekend. Call it bad planning. I don't care. <laughs> Pirates? Okay. Intervention in North Africa is a touchy subject for Americans today. It seems like for the last few decades we've done nothing but focus on North Africa and the Middle East. So when was Not the really first North time Africa, we had a conflict in the yeah, region? Libya, I guess. How about 1801? Yeah, when the U.S. was still a young nation and Thomas Jefferson was its president, America fought a four-year-long war against pirates off the coast of North Africa. These were called the Barbary War. I don't know about this. Awesome. And yes, there were two of them. At the okay, so you, Thomas Jefferson was very de was definitely into expanding America's borders. He's the one that uh, ends up doing the Louisiana Purchase, buying. Uh, originally, what 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 he wanted was uh, was was um, New Orleans, but Napoleon was you know, hard up for cash, so sold all of Louisiana, the middle middle third of America. So he was definitely into expanding American influence that way. But I had no idea it uh, got involved with this, though, this early, um, early 1800s. At the time, Muslim piracy was a major issue. The coastline of North Africa was made up of a series of pirate states on what was called the Barbary Coast. 
They included right. regions like Morocco, Ottoman-controlled Algiers, and even Tripoli. The main thing that united them was they really liked to raid incoming ships. European... I mean, Medi the Mediterranean, it's the 1800s. This is uh, Imperial Age where you get... <clears throat> Yeah, the Mediterranean's kind of for grabs. You see it in, like, the Napoleonic Wars and things like that, and especially the British were getting involved in places like Egypt because they would like to use Egypt to be able to connect through the Red Sea to get to uh, India, right? So the early 1800s was definitely a time of a lot of uh, naval competition, big time. And now American ships that would cross into the area would often be attacked, and had a ransom not be paid, its sailors would be sold into slavery. This was actually a crisis at the time. It became a debate whether or not to pay off the pirates or to fight them. Jefferson reasoned that paying off the ransoms only would encourage more piracy. When Jefferson became president, the pirate states tried to force another ransom, but Jefferson didn't comply. In response, Tripoli declared war on the US. Oh, did you know that? A little Tripoli. See how that went down, right? Eventually, all the Barbary states began raiding American ships. We today debate about how the president can use the military without an official declaration of war. Well, this kind happens all the time. It's happened a bunch of times. Congressional powers for declaration of war are supposed to go to Congress, um, but it's been multiple times. I mean, there hasn't been a declara early declaration of war ever in American history. In a, lot of in a lot of American wars. Um, there isn't some, but yeah, you often don't get it because they find ways to kind of skirt around it or don't call it a war, call it something else, and you can have military action technically without um, congressional approval, which has been a big controversy in American history of uh, abusing the rights that Congress is supposed to have for uh, declaring war. It's supposed to be one of the biggest ones that Congress is supposed to have. And to, to limit the power of the president. The president can't just wage wars in some tyrannical fashion. Conversation kind of began here. Congress concluded that Jefferson had the powers as commander-in-chief to stop the pirates, protect Americans, and destroy Barbary vessels. Effectively, this was the 19th century version of intervening against terrorists without a declaration of war. Battles were few in the period of four years. It was really just a naval blockade of North African cities with the occasional raid. There was one time the Americans took the city of Derna, raised the stars and stripes over foreign land. After four years of this war, Tripoli surrendered and a peace deal was made between the US and the Barbary Coast. Piracy remained an issue for decades in the region, leading to another Barbary War in 1815. Once European naval technology became far more advanced yeah, than, than the pirates, you know, Muslim piracy died in the region. Yeah, I would think most, once industrialization kicks in, I mean, the inequality of these naval technologies is, is crazy. So, yeah, I mean, it ends the whole Islamic dominance of the seas, too, altogether. Is it an industrialized? Leaving behind this strange tale of when Jefferson sent the Navy to fight against North African pirates for four years. Yeah, I know this one. Uh, that time America invaded Florida before it was a state. When Americans learn about the relationship between Americans was Spanish and held? natives, well, they don't really learn about it. We talk about the pilgrims and natives, then skip over to cowboys and Indians in the West. So really, most Americans only yeah. learn about the beginning and the end. True. We don't teach about the couple centuries of constant, and I do mean constant, conflict the united states spread very true gets glossed over um there are so, yeah so many conflicts for so long um when you get western expansion right after the received i, I talked about thomas jefferson um with with uh, uh the whole i guess manifest destiny thing in general which was america having this they believe right to colonize and civilize all of north america and of course that comes in direct conflict with groups that already live there like native americans have been pushed out further and further west through american expansion and that sort of thing and um conflicts were were constant you get those pioneers and pilgrims and all types of people that were moving out west and the clashes that they had uh with locals it's it's it was nasty right so yeah i mean i i, I like how he, he basically said that basically just what gets happened is or what what gets taught is 
they have the beginning of the relationship to the natives and then the very unfortunate end. And you get usually the sad things that come out of there, things like the Trail of Tears or something like that. Spreading across the continent wasn't just people in wagons moving and taking empty land. Yeah, not it the often case involved American soldiers fighting against a guerrilla style native resistance. Florida once used to be Spanish land, and in that Spanish land there was a native population, mostly called the Seminole. They lived there and formed an active military resistance to the United States. After the Seminole massacred nearby American settlers, the United States wanted retribution, yeah. and so the military was called in. That's usually what happened. If there was attack on white settlers, the retribution was total. The problem was, Spain actually hadn't given Florida to the United States yet, but that didn't matter. Andrew Jackson, a general at the time, gathered a force of 3,000 Americans and 1,400 Creek to... Um, yeah, uh, uh, President Jackson has been one of the ones that is pretty notorious for his interactions with natives and conducting like the Trail of Tears, which um, saw thousands of Native Americans forcefully and brutally uh, removed from their homes in the southeastern United States into territories in the Midwest. <coughs> um, one of the things he's known for the most. To break the Seminole resistance. Yes, this meant that the Americans had to invade Florida. The invasion mostly consisted of village burnings and leaders being hanged. The atrocities were condemned, but it's Jackson. He didn't care. There was a period of peace, Florida <laughs> became a state, but the Seminole were still a problem to the U.S. Well, when Jackson became president, they weren't an issue anymore. The U.S. created the Indian Removal Act, which yeah. meant all the natives east of the Mississippi had to get out of there. Yeah, get forced uh, in, in brutal conditions. A lot of them died. Um, it's seen as one of the kind of the black eyes often of American history of how they were treated. Even when you looked at soldiers that were assigned to remove these people and at escort, whatever you want to call it, um, these people out of their lands into places like Oklahoma, which gets kind of settled as a, as a native uh, American territory, uh, were very remorseful. And there's like letters and stuff, journal entries of um, these American soldiers that were like disgusted with it and they were ashamed to have been part of it. The Seminole understandably didn't like this, and the Americans knew it. And eventually, war did come. This war lasted... Wait... Six years? Wow. Wow. Yeah, this conflict against natives lasted longer than the U.S. was in World War II. So it's not... I mean, it's with Florida, but yeah, it's not... It's not... It, Spain has, like... It looks like, I mean, at this time, nothing to do with, with Florida. They don't really care about it. Like, oh, we have it? I forgot about that. It's basically a Native American state with, you know, the Seminoles. So that's really who it is less than uh, with Spain. The Americans could do little against a group which knew their land. Seminoles would routinely kill American settlers, and Americans would routinely torch Seminole villages. But still, even after years, the Americans would be stuck in that swamp. Sometimes for so long, they had to resort to eating their horses. Ugh. To be honest, this war is so interesting, it requires its own video. In fact, most native wars in the East do. But to cut it short, eventually after years of whittling down native resistance, the U.S. was able to drive the Seminole to a reservation in South Florida. I feel the war was just so brutal, and in such a regretful time in American history, it's mostly just been swept under the rug, yeah. at least in the states that aren't Florida. Sure. Yeah, let I me mean, make sense. That kind of sums up American attention to the history of Native Americans. All right, when we really needed a wall with Mexico. So it could be the Mexican-American War, like 1840s. What do they got? <laughs> history sure is great at perspective. There was a time that Mexico truly was sending their worst, and the border was legitimately so dangerous, the United States had to fight a war to keep the violence out. This was a conflict that raged from 1910 to 1919, simply known as the Border War. Okay, this is, I mean, yeah, this is, I mean, way after the Mexican-American War in the 1840s, but, okay, a border war, so is that like a war in a traditional sense, or more just trying to enforce some kind of policy um, in the 19... So we got the 19-teens here. This is definitely an era of... Uh, um, uh, a big era of American migration. 
from all around the world because America was um, becoming an industrial power with immense economic and job growth, which was a huge pull factor for people from all over the world to come to America from all continents, from Asia. A lot of people coming from like China and Japan. A lot of them going to the West, of course, though, and, and establish themselves into groups that were doing mining or railroad construction. And then huge chunks come, of course, coming from Europe um, that went to the East Coast for factory jobs or to the Midwest and agricultural jobs. But uh, yeah, this is the time of American economic growth is is huge because of there's uh, American success of, of um, industrial industrialization. Mexico pretty much collapsed and was in complete anarchic chaos. But yeah, I mean, you're going to have the Mexican Revolution, too, of happening. So you could see there's push and pull factors here. What's going on in Mexico with their revolutions and, and, and political turmoil that's been going on around the turn of the century there. But then the, the pull factors. So there's push and pull factors. Not even today's violence could come close to how bad it was. This was called the Mexican Revolution, which is way too complicated to get into right now. Long story short, Imagine a far worse Syrian civil war on America's border. It lasted 10 years and 2 million Mexicans died. This is something that's, it's amazing like in America how little is known about actual Mexican history. Like really, they don't know. They heard of Cinco de Mayo, which really has almost nothing to do with Mexico. <laughs> and is not really yeah, observed in, even in Mexico, but things like the Mexican Revolution. Um, but their 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 uh, long history with colonialism with with Spain and then with um, with Spain and then then with France and then within themselves of groups that were protesting things like land distribution and militarism and uh, uh, dictatorships. The war was just complicated and confusing, and the United States hated everybody involved, so they decided to just secure the border and fight anybody Shut who her down. to cross in. At some points, revolutionaries refugees, would just huh? attack American towns, and battles raged to stop the Mexican rebels from seizing it. Sometimes federal Mexicans tried to attack, and gangs and Germans... Like I said, it was a confusing time. In this time period, the United States basically just waited for Mexico to get it together, to stop people from attacking inside, and the Americans invaded Mexican territory at times too. This was a back and forth that continued until the Mexican Revolution ended by 1919. <coughs> was that the most interesting conflict? No, but it's a little bit of context <laughs> when we imagine how bad Mexico is today and how bad border violence could be. History teaches us that it could always be far worse. Yeah. Okay. No. Korean War 2. DMZ Boogaloo. <laughs> it's a good, uh... If anyone knows, it's the Electric Boogaloo. Great, great, great movie. All right, so the DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone. So maybe here we're talking the uh, the, the Korean War ended with an armistice, but never a peace treaty. What ends up getting agreed upon is a demilitarized zone among the North and South Korean border, where nobody was able to cross or, of course, to militarize. And technically speaking, if you didn't know, um, there is no, there has been no peace treaty with the Korean War. So technically. The war is still going on. They're just at an armistice. Now, this demilitarized zone in the areas that are allowed is have it's the most militarized border in the planet. There's like a million troops stationed over there. And you don't really get large scale attacks really on it, but you do see little skirmishes, especially with people like defecting. And then the whole uh, idea too, which is interesting about the, 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 the DMZ or just kind of the border there, which was um, trying to show up each other so if you've ever heard of this along some of the the closer borders between the two sides what north and south korea will do is build like try to build like impressive structures on the border to impress the other side like you're going to build a flagpole and then the other side is going to build an even bigger flagpole and then you have this big hotel looking building to make it look like each side is better and it, it gets interesting it's just like border competition but we'll see what they get here if they're going to get to militarism militarism here. For the last few months, everyone has feared that we would fight with North Korea for the first time in 70 years. But that's not true, because we actually fought against North Korea far sooner than that. There was a time sure. in the 1960s that America and South Korea fought against the North for three years. There was just a tiny conflict against the North in the 60s that never escalated into anything bigger. And when I mean tiny, I mean 400 North Koreans died, 
300 South Marks. Koreans and 40 Americans. The South tried to infiltrate the North and failed. The North tried to assassinate the South Korean leader. It was just a strange time. The North didn't have nukes and the South was still a backwater. America was too busy with Vietnam, so after three years of not wanting to escalate the fighting, it just stopped. It was soon just called the Korean DMZ conflict, okay. and everybody just forgot that it ever happened. The lesson here is you can always stop a war from escalating if you're already fighting a bigger one. So in conclusion, Jimmy, why did I make this video? I don't really know. It's Memorial Day. It's interesting to remember the less popular wars out there as well. <laughs> All right. If it's not much of a, I mean, I guess a little skirmish here um, with the the DMZ later. I wasn't sure what what other once the war was over, what kind of skirmishes, if they're semi large scale on the DMZ, actually happened. Uh, just sort of little things of you know people trying to uh, defect across the border, usually from the north to the south side, but never some n never really uh, military engagements. If there is one fight that people have recently began talking about. It's the fight for information privacy, and that's why this Nord video VPN? was sponsored by NordVPN. Yeah, that's the best segue I could come up with. Oh well. A VPN is a virtual private network. By accessing a private network with military-grade encryption, you can protect yourself. If recent events have shown anything, it's that protecting your privacy and information online is extremely important. As a content creator on the internet, it's something that I keep in mind every day. Basically, what NordVPN does is it secures your information whenever you go online, protects your IP address, and gives you that peace of mind in an age where information protection is everything. With all the news that Facebook has been extensively sharing user info and foreign hackers in Russia and China, now is the smartest time to get a resource that can help you protect yourself and your information. They have thousands of servers from 60 countries that you can access, and with a simple interface, it's easy to set up. Say I want to have a new address from Britain. Well, you I can want do it that. to be or say India part of another country, or China. NordVPN allows you to do that, and it works on any iOS or Android phones and Windows or Mac for computer. So if you want to just try it out, you can try it for 30 days absolutely free. Start protecting your internet experience today with 77% off a three-year plan by using the code Althist at nordvpn.com slash althist. To be honest, I never considered using something like this until recent events, and so I recommend if you want to stay safe online, this is a good option to go. This is Cody of Alternate History Hope. Okay. All right, well, um... You know, more just like skirmishes and stuff like that, I guess. Not really like traditional wars. So then I was wondering if, the, well, you know, what they would do if it would just be more like major conflicts that just don't get talked about much, like the ones I was talking about before, like maybe 18, War of 1812 or Mexican-American War, maybe even the Spanish-American War. Um, things that just get overshadowed by the grandeur of the American Civil War and the World Wars and Vietnam and stuff like that. But they went for, yeah, a little more, a little more uh, skirmishes. But those are great. I didn't really know much about other a lot of those um some of the context yeah like the mexican revolution or something like that but things like like the one in north africa with the pirates i, I hadn't heard of that before that was interesting to think about i didn't know that in that f's in the jeffersonian era that we were that involved in that time because for much of colonial american history america stayed out of especially european conflicts um because because we know it as monroe doctrine where it's like hey stay out of American business and Europe uh, will stay out of your business. You know what I mean? So you get that going there, but um, no, cool. Good little tidbits of history to, um, to, to, to remember there. All right. Well, what did you think? Um, do you think there are major wars and, and, and wars and stuff that don't get talked about enough um, specifically with American involvement? Um, what do you think? You can get a conversation going uh, down below in the comments. If you like this original video, make sure that you go down below and down in the description will be a link to it. Uh, sure to like it, give it a view. Definitely sub to uh, um, Alternate History Hub. They do awesome work and I've done um, quite a few reactions to them. So if you're into that, uh, more of the alternate history, look through my playlists and you could probably check out something that you'd be interested in. Again, this video was voted on by patron pledgers. 
If you'd like to be able to vote in polls, there's a link down below as well to our Patreon pledge, uh, pledging account there. And starting at, if you want to support the channel at a, a dollar a month, you can get involved and uh, get involved in polls there. Um, and just have a little more influence, I guess, with the channel there. But thank you so much. And thanks to everyone that is a patron pledger that has been supporting that way. All right. Also, if you'd like to get involved in more discussion, maybe you want to talk more about American history, uh, go ahead and join our Discord. We just passed 5,000 members of our Discord server. So there's all kinds of channels within our server of all kinds of history topics um, and non-history topics as well. So definitely uh, uh, invite you down there. And once again, a link down below will go ahead and take you there. All right. But in the end, thanks for just being here, um, for for being interested in history, supporting history education. It means a lot. Very important. Really appreciate you supporting the channel and, again, history education in general. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and end here. We'll see you next time. Bye.